All right, we're going to get into the word. Are you ready to hear it? Someone say yes. All right, that was pitiful. Let's try again. Come on, you're the 11 o'clock service. You're the rowdy bunch. Let's go. Are you ready for the word? Someone say yes. There we go. All right. We are in week six of a series that we started back at our anniversary service uh, in September. And for the many of you that are joining us for the first time today, uh, let me do my best to catch you up to speed. Uh, We are calling this series By Faith, The Sequel. And the reason we're calling it The Sequel is because we started out this year with a phrase that the Holy Spirit gave to us that we believed was going to guide us into all God had for the Father's house in 2022. And it was those two words, by faith. Uh, At the beginning in January, we discussed the book of Hebrews chapter 11, where we read about a number of men and women who lived these great lives of faith. They left a legacy as a result of, of their lifestyle of faith, but all of their stories in Hebrews 11 start out with those two words, by faith. By faith, Abel offered uh, a sacrifice that was more pleasing to God. By faith, Enoch, he did not taste death. He was taken up into heaven. By faith, Noah built a boat. By faith, Abraham went to a place that he did not know of. And on and on the stories went. And we considered their stories by asking ourselves a very simple question. If our lives were to be preceded by those two words, how would our story read? If the whole totality of your life was distilled down into a single sentence as it was for them, what would it be said of you? What did you accomplish by faith? Because we know that ultimately God did not just call a bunch of people in scripture in times past to live by faith. How many know he's called all of us to live great lives of faith here on earth? Yes, in 2022. And so we've considered those words on and off throughout this year. But even though that series concluded in the spring, We couldn't shake the fact that there was still so much more God wanted to do in this family before the conclusion of this year by those two words. More more healings we hadn't seen yet, more breakthrough we hadn't seen yet, more names that are written down on cards in this box that need to come to know Jesus this year. And so rather than just tuck it away as a series in the spring, we decided to lean back into those two words and consider again for the remainder of our time together this year, what is God calling us to accomplish now by faith? Only this time, as we go through the series, we're not looking at Hebrews any longer. We're actually looking at a song that we released a couple of weeks ago, By Faith, and the corresponding scriptures that inspired the lyrics of that song. Each week, we are taking a lyric and using it as a catalyst for these these teachings. Uh, Today, I want to look at a phrase in the bridge of that song uh, where we sing this, waves bow down, mountains move, demons shake when we mention you. Uh, Last week, we talked about that last line, when we mention you. We looked at Philippians chapter two. Uh, Today, I wanna look at the beginning of that line where waves bow down. Will you say that with me? Waves bow down. Uh, That phrase, it, it comes from not one, but two stories in the scriptures where the waves themselves, the waters themselves respond to the authority of Jesus. And so this is going to be a two-part sermon. We're gonna look at the first of those events today and the second of them next weekend and consider them both individually and collectively and ask ourselves, what do they tell us about the life of faith? Uh, The first of them takes place in Mark chapter four. If you got a Bible, you can turn there now. Uh, Let me provide a little bit of context before we go to the scriptures. Uh, Jesus here in Mark chapter four, he is teaching on the shores of Galilee and crowds from all over have gathered to hear his teaching. Uh, He realizes that his voice cannot carry. He didn't have a microphone back then. And so he tells his disciples to, to load up in a boat and to paddle out a few meters from the shore so that his voice can carry and amplify on the waters. And then he begins to teach throughout the majority of Mark chapter four on the subject of faith. Specifically, he he uses parables, these stories, fictional stories that display a spiritual truth about seed and how seed correlates to faith. Uh, The first story is about a seed that is planted in four different kinds of soil. The first of the soil was shallow, then rocky, then thorny, and then the last was was good soil. And, And at the conclusion, he says, True faith is like that good soil that swallows up a seed and produces a hundredfold harvest. The second parable he he teaches is about a farmer who goes out to plant a seed in his field and he waters it and it grows to maturity and, and then it is harvested. And then the last of those parables is about a mustard seed, which he says is the smallest of all seeds, but it produces one of the largest plants in the garden. And as Jesus concludes this day's teaching about faith, 
he looks at his disciples and he says, let's go ahead and stay in this boat and make our way to the other side of the lake. It's getting late, the sun is setting, let's head over there. And this is where we pick up the story in the book of Mark chapter four, verse 35. It says, as evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross over to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and they started out, leaving the crowds behind, although the other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a pillow. The disciples woke him up shouting, teacher, don't you care that we're gonna drown? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and he said to the waves, silence, be still. I almost spent the whole sermon on that sentence right there. He rebuked the wind and he said to the waves. In other words, Jesus did not just deal with the fruit of the problem, he dealt with the root of the problem. The wind is what stirred up those waves. Hey, God's not just interested in dealing with the addiction, he's interested in dealing with why you're addicted. He's not just interested in dealing with the sickness, he wants to get to the root of that family curse in your bloodline. He will deal with the root of the problem and not just the fruit of the problem. But I ain't got time to preach on that today. We're gonna go somewhere else with this. Suddenly, the wind stopped and there was a great calm. And then Jesus asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? Did you hear the sermon I just preached? Did you listen to the analogies and the parables that I just shared? Did you show up late to the service and you didn't catch a sermon? What, did you, do you have any faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man, they asked each other. Even the wind and the waves obey him. Th this is probably one of the most iconic and significant displays of Jesus' power in scripture. And it is loaded with faith application. But the whole thing starts with this, this simple phrase that Jesus utters to his disciples. He says, come, let's go to the other side of the lake. I wanna call this hello from the other side part one, and we'll hit part two next weekend. Let's pray. Jesus, we welcome you right now to speak to us over these next few moments. I thank you for today and the significance of what's taken place even at this service, but I know that you're not done. I know that there are things you still want to speak to us. I thank you that your word is transformative in nature, that it can never be taught, it can never be cast out into a room like this without accomplishing its purpose. And so I pray according to Psalm 119 that the entrance of your word into the lives of those here today would bring light, it would bring clarity, and it would bring encouragement. Speak to us today by your spirit, in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen, amen, amen. Uh, I would imagine that this is probably one of the most popular portions of scripture taught on. Every, every pastor likely has a few storm sermons in their arsenal, I, I know I do. And as a guy who has taught this text before and has studied it extensively over my years as a pastor, I must admit there is a temptation in stories like this to quickly rush through the details and get to the climactic ending where Jesus stands up in the middle of this tumultuous storm and with all the authority of heaven, he looks at the wind and he looks at the waves and he commands them to be still and know that he is God and, and drops the mic and looks at his disciples and he's like, what? Where's your faith at, bro? And then the disciples are, man, who is this? that even the wind and the waves obey this man's voice. I admit, there's a temptation to rush there. And fear not, we will get to that part in this sermon. You can take your hanky out now and warm up your vocal cords for when we get there. There will be shouting and, and praise as we celebrate the climactic end. However, I don't wanna rush to that point of this story because I, I wanna mine the goodness of the details that Mark provides for us here in this text. In fact, I wanna go on record and suggest that perhaps for you and me, the greater application and, and the greater relevance of this text is not the end, but it's what takes place in the beginning. Specifically, I wanna look at this thought in verse 38, where Mark tells us that while this storm is howling around the disciples, Jesus finds himself curled up in the back of the boat with his head on a pillow taking a nap, just sawing some logs, counting sheep, 
97, 98, 99. I feel like I'm missing one. It's Bible humor, I know. You'll get it on the way home. Just tuck it in your pocket. Oh, Luke 15, okay. I find this detail incredibly comical, but I also find it really comforting. I mean, just sometimes you gotta put yourself in the text when you read Bible and, and wonder what it was like to be one of these disciples. Just imagine for a moment you are here with Jesus on this day. He's just taught an incredible sermon. People are high-fiving and, and they're excited and the sun is setting and Jesus says, hey, get in this boat. We're gonna head out to the other side of the lake. So, so you and your friends, you, you set out to paddle. Jesus goes into the back of the boat, takes a little rest. But in the middle of this five mile journey, you find yourself along with your buddies in the worst storm you have ever seen before. And I know that that's not written in the text, but here's how we know that to be true. Remember Jesus' disciples, most of these guys, they were fishermen. They were very familiar with the waters that they were floating on in this moment. They, they, they are not uh, unaware of the unpredictability of the weather here. And they've seen some storms on the Sea of Galilee, but none like this. Suddenly they are terrified. They're, they're crying out, we're gonna die, and they're bailing water out of the side of the boat. But there's Jesus, just chilling in the back of the boat, unmoved by what's happening. What a dichotomy. The, the, the screaming disciple and the sleeping Jesus. I find that comical. Let me, let me just check. Anyone know somebody who can sleep anywhere at any time? You know anyone like that? Like that grandfather after Thanksgiving, you're in the middle of a conversation, he's sitting on the lazy boy, just and the, Anyone know someone like that? If you know me, you do know somebody like that. I am that guy. I can sleep anywhere. I have been known to fall asleep in some very precarious places. I've fallen asleep on an Uber before. I've fallen asleep on Muni. I've fallen asleep in many airplanes to the point where it landed and I did not know that it landed. Uh, I've fallen asleep in the movie theaters. I can sleep anywhere. But my wife is, is not quite the same as me in this respect. She is um, a bit of a sleep diva. Do I have any sleep divas in the room? Okay, let, let me explain what I mean by that. Like things have to be perfect. You gotta have the right temperature, the right blanket, the right pillow, you gotta have a mask over your face, a little bit of white noise playing. In my home, I don't know if this is like yours, but for whatever reason, Robin requires about 85% of the surface area of our mattress while I sleep on a sliver on the other side. Anyone else suffer from that? That plague, okay, yeah, 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 you know what I'm talking about. I'm like, you're not that big. You don't need that much space, I don't understand. But I'm not like that. I could sleep on a sliver of the bed, I could sleep in an Uber, I can sleep anywhere, which according to this story makes me a lot more like Jesus than my wife. I'm just, <laughs> follow me as I follow Christ, my love. <laughs> Did you just do the friends thing to me? Okay, whatever. <laughs> uh, I just find that detail really comical, a sleeping Jesus. But, but as I said, I also find this detail really comforting, and, here, and here's why. I think this image of the Messiah sleeping in the back of a boat in the middle of a storm, I think it reveals something to us about Christ. I think it reveals to us that he responds quite a bit differently to storms than we do. Specifically, I think it reveals that our Jesus has the ability to be calm in the midst of chaos. So calm, in fact, that at times it can feel like he is sleeping on the job, just still. Which, according to research, may not actually be the worst thing. I was doing a little digging this week into the science of sleep. And uh, there's some incredible things that take place in your body as you lay down to sleep on a neurological level, on a chemical level, on a physical level. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of data here, but here, here's what I read in the article this week. When we sleep, our breathing slows down, our heart rate slows to roughly 40 to 50 BPM, our muscles gradually relax, the body's total energy expenditure drops, and our brain activity slows. Additionally, sleep increases the production of health hormones, including melatonin, which promotes more sleep, growth hormones, which promote development, and cortisol, which regulates the body's stress response system. Thank you, science, for helping me preach the sermon today. Are, are you seeing the contrast here between the disciples and Jesus? Just using that scientific data, look, look at the contrast. You got disciples, heart rate through the roof, Breathing, panting heavily as they're bailing water out of the boat. Everything on them stressed. They're screaming. They're scared. But here's Jesus. 
calm, heart rate steady, breathing steady, recovering, doing just fine. This picture of Jesus, I think it is a beautiful image of his ability to remain calm in a storm. Because listen, these waves that were crashing, they were not simply crashing into the boat of the disciples, they were also crashing into the hearts of the disciples. They were not afraid about their boat, they were afraid for their lives. But those waves never made their way into the heart of Jesus. He, he is not moved by the things that move his disciples. He's not scared of waves. He's not scared of winds. Let's make it personal. He is not terrified of a terminal diagnosis. He is not concerned about a financial problem that you might be facing. He's not worried about what might take place tomorrow or whether things are gonna unravel. His brow does not sweat with anxiety as he considers the possibilities. He's steady. He's calm. He's consistent. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. But that presents a problem sometimes for us. It presents a problem sometimes for disciples. This is where the disciples' faith is tested. It is where our faith is tested time and time again. Because when you see Jesus still in the middle of your storm, you are tempted to believe that his stillness equates to his negligence. Look at this line, this accusation that comes from the mouth of the disciples, Mark 4.38. Teacher, they say, don't you care that we're going to drown? Don't you care? I think that line, that question, it reveals the frailty of their faith. I think it, it's why Jesus turns at the conclusion of this story and looks them in the eyes and says, why were you so afraid? Did you not have any faith? Because they make this accusation, don't you care? Listen, Jesus was not mad at them and he did not question their faith because they cried out for help in the middle of a difficult situation. He, he does not think that that equates to faithful, faithlessness. Let, let's be clear. When you cry out to God in the middle of a storm, I think that's evidence of faith, not evidence of a lack thereof. In that moment, what you're saying is, I do not trust a, a person or a program or an authority or anybody else to provide for what I need. I'm grateful for doctors. I'm grateful for medication. I'm grateful for counseling. They all serve their part. However, my source of help is in the Holy One. It is from His mountain that I receive all that I need. That's an act of faith to cry out to God in the midst of a storm. But when that cry turns to an accusation, now you have a crisis of faith on your hands. When that cry turns into, don't you care? Don't you care about what I'm walking through? Don't you care about my sickness? Don't you care about my family? Don't you care about my daughter? Don't you care about my lack? Do you not see my pain and my suffering? I thought I got onto a boat with a God that cared. I said yes in, in that service on a Sunday morning. I raised my hand. I gave my life to Jesus. I thought I had gotten into a relationship with a God who cared. But evidently I did not. Because you don't seem to care about what I'm walking through right now. Hold up. Gear down, shifter. Let's, let's think about this for a moment. Don't you care? What does it mean to care? Truly, what does it mean? Is it care? If someone you know and love is suffering with alcohol or drug addiction and they spend all of their money on their next fix but don't ever pay their bills and so they keep coming to you for help with the rent and you keep offering them money every single time so that they can repeat the cycle, is that care? Parents, if your kid finds themselves in the same problem over and over and over and over again and you just keep bailing them out and letting them repeat the cycle, is that care? And if you're responsible for 12 disciples that are going to be the ones to birth the New Testament church, and they're gonna to need to have some stamina to stand up against Rome, if they're gonna to need to have the ability to weather 
some, some pain and some suffering and some beatings and even being hung upside down on a cross, is it care for you to quickly rescue them from the storm they find themselves in? Or is a better version of care where you allow them to sit in that storm for a little bit of time and develop a little bit so that their lips can later speak out the gospel that you're calling them to declare? What does care truly look like? Don't confuse care and enablement. Sometimes the greatest way God can care for you is to let you sit in a storm for a little bit of time so that your faith can be matured, so that you can be developed. Let, let me preach something that isn't popular, probably won't elicit many amens, but that's cool. I don't need him for encouragement. That's fine. It's the truth. Does God care? Absolutely. But he cares far more about your development than he does about your comfort. He cares far more about the integrity of your faith than he does about the expediency of your storm. And do not get it twisted, friends. You will never develop true faith without some storms in your life. You will never grow unless you go through some things. Let me, let me say it consistent with the analogy Jesus is using here. That seed of faith, it needs some water to grow. So don't be surprised when Jesus allows a little bit of water to crash into your boat so that your faith is not rooted in the shallow soil of pleasant circumstances, but your roots grow down deep into who he truly is. That's what true faith looks like. James chapter one, consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters, when you endure trials of many kinds, because it's the testing of your faith that produces some perseverance inside of you. You wanna grow, you wanna develop, you wanna be able to stand strong. You're gonna to need to go through some waves and some wind and some storms. You're gonna to need to know what it feels like to be developed in the storm. So next time you find yourself, or if you're there today in the middle of a trial, be careful about the accusations you make. You don't care, God, you don't know. No, he does. And perhaps the best way he cares for you is not in an expedient display of his power, but it's in the promise of his presence in your storm. To sit with you in the midst of that storm while you're being developed. Just hear his voice even now. Son, daughter, I get it. I know it's difficult. I see it. I'm not blinded to what you're facing. I know it's challenging. I know it feels like Every day you're getting hit from every side, but I promise you something is being developed right now that can't be developed anywhere else. I'm doing something in your soul right now that cannot be accomplished any other way. So do not rush from this moment. Don't make the accusations. Don't turn and run away from me. Learn how to sit with me in this. If you get nothing else out of this, this sermon today, I pray you get this one thing. Don't miss your moment to sit with Jesus in the storm. Yes, pray. Pray for deliverance. Pray for healing. Pray for your lost sons and daughters. Knock, seek, ask. Cry out to Almighty God in heaven to do a miracle. But while you're crying out to Jehovah Rapha to heal, or Jehovah Jireh to provide, or Jeho Jehovah Shalom to bring peace, or, or any of the other names of God, do not forget that you are sitting in the storm with Emmanuel, the one that is with you in this moment. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He's with you in the waves. Don't miss your moment to sit with him in this storm. Because, listen, the storm is not going to last forever. I don't know, maybe I would be preaching this a little bit different if, if my life was different right now. Maybe I would draw some different application from this text if we were not walking through what we're walking through with our daughter and we had seen a healing. Maybe I'd find a different angle if we did not put her on a brand new medication this week that is traditionally reserved for those fighting cancer in hopes that we can manipulate her cellular structure of blood and try to find another way to get it flowing correctly in her body to her liver. Maybe I'd be saying something different. But that's my story right now. And I'd imagine there's probably a lot of people that are not on the other side of their thing yet. And while I'm grateful for the end of this story, man, I find comfort in the fact that there is a Jesus in the boat with me right now, sitting in my storm. Do I pray for healing every day? 
Do I believe that he can? More than ever. Of course I do. Do I, I long for the moment where he stands up in the middle of my storm and he commands the waves to be still? Absolutely I do. But right now, I'm just grateful that he's standing with me in the middle of what I'm walking through. I find comfort in the fact that when my daughter looks at me and she says, Daddy, why hasn't Jesus healed me yet? I don't have to make excuses for God or peddle some cheap theology about not having enough faith but I can say, baby girl, I do not know why Jesus hasn't healed you yet, but here's what I know to be true. No matter how many waves crash into this boat, no matter how many times we go back for another procedure, Jesus sits with us right now in the middle of all of this and he's not going anywhere. Don't miss your moment to sit with him in the storm because listen, and here's where you break out your hanky and you get ready to celebrate. As the title of this sermon suggests, and as the story promises, you might be in the middle of a storm right now. I just saw that hanky, thank you, Jazzy. But listen, there is another side. There's another side to your storm. Remember how Jesus started this whole story out. He looked at his disciples confidently, and what did he say? Let us go to the other side of the lake. He did not say, I'm gonna go over there, he did not say, let's get in this boat and see what happens. No, he looked at them with confidence and said, if you get into this boat with me right now, I promise you we will make it to the other side of this lake. Come on, you need to celebrate a little bit today that you are not gonna be stuck in this season forever, but there is another side to your storm. Every Jesus disciple in the room today, listen, there's another side to your sickness. There's another side to your marital situation right now. There's another side to your, your depression or your addiction. There's another side to your pain and your suffering. Jesus still heals. He still restores. He still provides. He still stands up and speaks to wind and commands waves to be still. The sun will come out tomorrow. You can bet your bottom. There is another side to your storm. And lest I be accused of, of, of lopsided theology, let me say this as well. There's another side to death as well. I don't understand why Jesus heals some and not others. I don't understand the delay. I don't need to. But, but here's what I know to be true. Scripture says that death does not have the final word for the believer. Death, where is your victory? Grave, where is your sting? To live is Christ, but to die is gain. Even in death, there is another side to your storm. And my job and your job is not to sit back and criticize the timing of God or suggest that he does not care. Our job is to rest in his nearness and cling to his promise that this thing is not gonna be here forever, but there is another side to our storm. That's our job. Don't miss the moment. But recognize, you will get to the other side of this thing. I'm low on time, so I'm going to invite the worship team to come. We got other stuff to do. I got one more thought I want to throw at you before we conclude. Obviously, this, this story today is, is very near and dear to my family and our chapter of life right now. But as I was studying the text this week, there was a line in the story that, that jumped out and bore unique significance to me and in light of last weekend's events, it's something that I wanted to conclude with today. But I don't think that I'm alone in, in drawing application from it. I think it's something that applies to all of us. Uh, the line is found after Jesus invites the disciples to join him on the journey. And, and here's what Mark includes in his gospel in verse 36. It says, so the disciples, they took Jesus into the boat and they started out leaving the crowds behind. And then look at this although other boats followed. Although other boats followed. Apparently, the disciples were not the only ones on the lake this day. Apparently, there were some other boats, some other people who had just heard Jesus preach that said, we're gonna join on this journey to the other side of the lake. And you know what that tells me? If they were not alone, on the journey, they were also not alone in the storm. 
there were some other people experiencing what they experienced this day. Some other boats that didn't have Jesus in them that were trying to weather the wind and the waves. Last thought, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Your storm is your sermon. Your storm is your sermon. I'm not the only preacher here today. I know public speaking is terrifying for many people. Sorry, it's your job too. (laughs) You're a preacher. You are preaching with your life, whether you like it or not. In the same way that Jesus stood on that boat and he began to preach from that pulpit about faith, you are standing on a boat right now in your storm and that is your pulpit. You are preaching to some people. There's some other boats around you that are watching. Your family is watching. Your kids are watching. Your coworkers are watching. Your friends that don't know Christ are watching. People in this room who may not have been on the journey as long as you, they're watching. And they're watching to see what the boat with Jesus on it does in the storm. And every time you come up to these altars at the conclusion of a service and you ask for prayer, even though you haven't seen the answer yet, they're watching. And every time you go back for another round of IVF or you try to have a baby once again, even though you just lost one, they're watching. When you step into that 105th counseling session for your marriage and it doesn't feel like it's working, but you love your spouse and you're willing to do the work, they're watching. When you pick yourself up after another bender and you crawl into that AA meeting or that recovery meeting and you go, I just know I need help, they are watching you. And yes, when you stand on this stage an hour after your daughter goes into the ER and you declare that there is still power in the name of Jesus to see every knee in the heavenly realms and on earth and below the earth bow down and confess Him as Lord, they are watching. They're watching and I know, because I'm with you, sometimes it feels like that storm is about to take you out and all you want to do is crawl away and die. But you're preaching and they're watching. And if you give up, they might give up. If you quit, they might quit. If you let this storm decimate your faith, they may allow for the same. But friends, if you keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, if you rest in His nearness and you cling to His promise, then mark my words, you will not be the only boat that makes it to the other side, but there will be a line of people that find themselves on the same shore because they're watching. So let me borrow the words of Jesus. Don't be afraid. Don't lose faith. Jesus is still in your boat and there's another side to your storm. Don't bail out early. Learn how to sit with him in this moment and cling to that promise. There's another side to this thing. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for you. Why don't you bow your heads? Before I I make the familiar invitation at the conclusion of this service and invite anyone who's far from Christ to come to life in Him. I want to I want to pray for our community briefly. In fact, even now, if, if you're walking through something that's challenging, a health situation, marriage situation, something with your kids, talk to a few people yes, uh, uh, first service that we're navigating through an unemployment or a layoff this week, if you need to, that nearness of Jesus to just feel more real than it's ever felt, would you just quickly lift your hands up towards heaven as I pray right now? Father, you see every disciple in the boat. I pray that there would not be a moment of doubt where we question whether or not you're aware or you care. But even now that the nearness of God would become a reality that's greater than the reality they're facing. I love this line. May may they be more convinced of what they see with their eyes closed than with them open. Emmanuel, God with them. Come close. Help us to be developed through what we're walking through. 
but help us to keep our eyes on the shore that you're calling us to. In Jesus' name. With every uh, head bowed and eye closed, I want to issue a very simple invitation talking about the reality of Jesus on a boat. A boat representing your life. Maybe you're here this morning and you'd say, Tim, I, I don't feel like I've got that Jesus with me right now. I feel like there's distance between us. Maybe you've never made that decision to invite him into your life. In just a moment, I want to pray a very simple prayer of commitment with you. A prayer that's not challenging or difficult, but simply an invitation to say, Jesus, would you make your way into my life? Forgive me of my sin. Be with me on this journey. And if you need to do that, I want to pray that prayer of commitment with you. But before I do that, I need to know who I'm praying with this morning. If you want to be included in that prayer and pray along with me this morning to commit your life to Jesus, would you quickly lift your hand and look up at me so I know who I'm praying with? Got you there right on? Yeah, right over here, bro. Awesome. Yes, got you right here. Cool. Yeah, cool. Right back there. I don't want to miss anyone. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, all right here. Awesome. <laughs> cool. Okay, you guys can put your hands down. Thank you. Church, would you join these making this decision this morning and pray out loud so they don't feel alone? Say, Jesus, today I give you my life. I invite you in to be my Lord. I receive forgiveness by your death on the cross and new life by your resurrection. Help me to be your disciple and walk in your ways from this day forward until we meet in eternity. In Jesus' name. Come on, church. Let's celebrate every single one of those making that decision this morning. Hallelujah. Oh, come on. You can do better than that. Let's, let's shout with the angels. Hallelujah.